Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, that with full courage, now as always Christ, will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Thank you, Mackenzie. Well, this morning we continue our sermon series in the book of Philippians, and as we do, we come to chapter 1, um, looking at this passage Mackenzie just read in verses 18 through 26. Um, it's about almost uh, 50 years ago, a pastor by the name of Wilbur Reese, he wrote a little poem, and that poem was converted into a book uh, that was entitled, Three Dollars Worth of God. About 25 years ago, a New Testament scholar by the name of D.A. Carson uh, took that poem and he adapted it and he began his um, exposition, his commentary on the book of Philippians with these words. I would like to buy about $3 worth of gospel, please. Not too much, just enough to make me happy, but not so much that I get addicted. I don't want so much gospel that I learn to really hate covetousness and lust. I certainly don't want so much that I start to love my enemies, cherish self-denial, and contemplate missionary service in some alien culture. I want ecstasy, but not repentance. I want transcendence, not transformation. I would like to be cherished by some nice, forgiving, broad-minded people, but I myself don't want to love those people from different races, especially if they smell. I would like enough gospel to make my family secure and my children well-behaved but not so much that I find my ambitions redirected or my giving too greatly enlarged. I would like about $3 worth of the gospel, please. And so I I doubt any of us are are probably brave enough to to raise our hands and to be able to say, yeah, I've I've thought that before, and uh, sometimes, yeah, that's that's what I want. I I just want $3 worth of gospel. I just want $3 worth of, of Jesus. But the reality, I, th- I think practically, just like Kevin prayed, practically, I think in, in our lives, this is really all we want. Like, we, we don't want a Jesus that's going to radically reorient our lives, or we don't want a Jesus that's going to just completely overhaul our lives. We don't want a Jesus that's going to push us outside of our comfort zone, or a Jesus that's going to ask us to sacrifice and do hard things, or a Jesus who demands to be Lord and, and preeminent in our lives. Instead, we'd just rather have $3 worth of Jesus instead. Just enough of Jesus to save us from our sins. Just enough of Jesus to give us hope and purpose and meaning in life. Just enough of Jesus so we won't be lonely um, in our lives. That's, That's all the Jesus we want. In our passage this morning, though, what we're gonna see is is that this wasn't the case with Paul. Paul. We're going to see that with Paul, $3 worth of Jesus wasn't enough for him. Instead, for Paul, he he wants and he wanted all of Jesus. And the reason he wanted all of Jesus is because Jesus is his everything. Like, this is a man who's consumed with Jesus. The preeminent passion, the supreme desire in his life is Jesus. He's got no greater love than Jesus. His, His supreme passion in his life is none other than Jesus. He cherishes Jesus. He loves Jesus. He he longs for Jesus. Jesus is his everything. And so then Paul's love of Jesus and desire for Jesus that we're going to see within this passage this morning is going to be an example for us this morning. And it's not only going to be an example for us, it's going to be a challenge for us this morning in regards to how much of Jesus we want in our lives. And whether or not we're just satisfied with $3 worth of Jesus, or whether or not we're consumed with Jesus, and we want all of Jesus, like Paul wants all of Jesus here. 
And so what we're going to do as we explore this passage of Scripture, what we're going to see in Paul's example here are just four different characteristics, four different characteristics of a life who treasures Jesus above all, a, a life that, that's consumed with Jesus, whose preeminent desire and passion above anything and everything else in their life is Jesus. And as we see these different characteristics of a life that treasures Jesus above anything and everything else, it's going to do two things for us. Number one, it's going to expose our hearts, right? It's going to expose those areas in our lives in which this isn't true of us. It's going to, it's going to shine a spotlight into those areas and the affections and desires and longings in our hearts that if we were honest, we desire other things a whole lot more than we desire Jesus. At the same time, the second thing that, that, these, that these characteristics that Paul's example is going to do for us, it's not only going to expose our hearts, but I pray and hope that it's also going to stir our affections for Christ. That when we see the example of Paul and, and, and the treasure that Jesus is for him, I pray that it would cause our hearts to treasure Jesus in the same way and to stir our affections the same way and cause us to be as consumed with Jesus as Paul is consumed with Jesus in these verses here this morning. So four different characteristics of a life that treasures Jesus above all. Here's, here's the first characteristic. You can see it on your hand out there. It's that you're more concerned, or I kind of adapted this. You can't see it on your handout, okay? This is an audible kind of adapted this. You can write some of this in. You're more concerned with the glory of Christ than you are your life or your death. You're more concerned with the glory of Christ than, than life or death. We see this in the example of Paul here starting in verse, the second part of there in verse 18. Before we jump into the second part here in verse 18, it's important to remember the context that we're in and remember the verses that we've seen up to this point in Philippians. So then if you remember, Paul begins this letter, the first 11 verses in Philippians, with a thanksgiving. And in this, these first 11 verses, he thanks the Philippian church for their partnership in the gospel. If you remember, Paul's been on his missionary journeys for about 12 years, and during those 12 years, the Philippians have partnered with him in the gospel. They've prayed for him, they've financially supported him, they've sought to share the gospel in Philippi, they've been good partners with him in the gospel for the last 12 years. In verses 12 through 18 then, what we saw last week, he gives the Philippians then an update on his present situation. So he thanks them for their advancement, for their partnership in the gospel, and then in 12 through 18, he gives them an update. He, hey, here's, here's what's going on, how I'm doing, here's my present situation. And if you remember his present situation, he's imprisoned in Rome. He's in house arrest in Rome. And so he wants the Philippians then to know in verses 12 through 8 that his current situation, his current imprisonment has served to advance the gospel. And because this current situation in prison has served to advance the gospel, then Paul rejoices. He rejoices. Even though he's suffering, even though he's in prison, he rejoices because his imprisonment has served to advance the gospel. In the rest of verse 18, then look there with me. He says these words. He says, yes, and I will rejoice. So there's a transition that's going on here. In verse 12, he said that he now rejoices, presently rejoices, because his imprisonment has led to and served to advance the gospel. But then at the end of verse 18, he, he transitions from talking about um, his present situation, and now he's talking about his future situation. And so in verse 12, he, he, he says that he presently now rejoices because the gospel is being advanced in his imprisonment. And now in verse 18, he says that he's going to continue, he will continue to rejoice in the future, which then begs the question, why? Why is Paul going to continue to rejoice in the future? Well, he tells us there in verse 19, look there with me at verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. What Paul's talking about there, he's talking about future tense here, all these wills here. He's talking about his upcoming trial before the emperor. And he's saying that his upcoming trial is going to result in his deliverance. 
And the next verse in verse 20 unpacks and explains what Paul, what Paul means by that and what he expects is going to happen. Look at verse 20. He says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And so then this is Paul's expectation, his, his hope of what's going to happen when he goes to court, when he goes to trial before the emperor. His expectation is that he's not going to be put to shame. He's not going to be put to shame when he goes to court and appears before the emperor. Instead, what he expects is, is what he says in verse 19. He expects that the Philippians are going to be praying for him as he goes to court and appears before the emperor. And as the Philippians are praying for him, then as a result, the Holy Spirit is going to give Paul courage, and the Holy Spirit's going to help him to get his mouth open and testify of Jesus and speak with boldness at court before the emperor. Like that, if you have an ESV Bible, that's what the words there, full courage, means in verse 20. That word could literally be translated as bold, frank speech. It was a word that was often used in reference to bold speech that was given at court or in the midst of hostility and opposition. And so what Paul's saying here is that he's going to go to court. The Philippians are praying for him. As a result of the Philippians praying for him, the Spirit is going to help him to get his mouth open and speak with bold, frank speech at court. And as a result of that, it's going to lead to his deliverance, meaning he's going to be delivered from prison. Either living or dying. He can be delivered from prison. He can be delivered from court either in a live body or a dead body. Either way, he's getting delivered. And Christ is going to be magnified as Paul boldly proclaims Jesus at court. And because of that, in Paul's mind, it, it doesn't matter how it turns out. It doesn't matter whether he's freed. It doesn't matter if he's executed. Paul's going to rejoice because, because Christ is going to be magnified, either through his living body or through his dead body. Like, that's his one and only concern. His concern going to court isn't, isn't whether he's going to be freed and live. His concern going to court isn't if he's going to be executed and have his head, cut off, his, his head cut off. His only concern when he goes to court is that he's able to not be ashamed and he's, and he's able to get his mouth open and boldly, with bold, frank speech, testify of Jesus at, at court. And as a result of that, Christ being magnified through his body. That's all he cares about is, is Jesus being magnified as he goes to court, whether that means that his, Jesus is magnified through Paul's dead body or through Paul's living body. It doesn't matter to him as long as Jesus is, is magnified. That's crazy. But that's the first characteristic here of a man, of, of a woman, of a life that treasures Jesus above all. Like their number one concern in any and every situation, every circumstance, isn't them. It's not their well-being. It's, it's, it's whether or not Jesus is magnified. It, it's not what happens to them. The effect that this is going to have on me, what this will mean for me. That, that's, that's the furthest thing from Paul's mind here. All he cares about is that it turns out for the glory of Jesus. And so then, like, practically speaking, like, he, here's the key in all this. And this is really hard to swallow. But the key to having this sort of, of mindset and, and heart posture is to realize that you're not the end goal. You're just not the end goal. You and your life and your circumstances and every situation you find yourself in is a means to a greater end. And that greater end is the glory and the majesty of Jesus. That, that's the mindset. That's the secret. It's, it's realizing that in God's economy, your comfort isn't his end goal. In God's economy, your physical well-being isn't his end goal. In God's economy, your happiness isn't his ultimate end goal. Your life is a means to a greater end. 
And that end is the majesty and the honor of Jesus. And when you understand that, when you, when you develop that sort of heart posture and mindset, then it completely changes how you face uncertainty in your life. It completely changes how you face difficulties in your life. Whether that be a health scare, whether that be a, a financial struggle, emotional turmoil, or even potential death. That if you understand that your life is a means to his greater end, then instead of always praying, God, save me from this. God, make, make, get me out of this difficulty. Just make things better. Instead, your prayer changes. And your prayer becomes, God, here I am. Here's my life. Here's this situation. Here's this circumstance. I'm not the end goal. You're the end goal. I'm a means to your end. So use this. Use me for your majesty and glory and, and to make your, your great name known. Like, that's, that's hard. But that's the first characteristic of a life that treasure, doesn't treasure themselves above all, but a life that treasures Jesus above all. They're more concerned with the glory of Christ than their own life and death. The second characteristic, then, of a life that treasures Jesus above all is this. It's that you live to proclaim Christ. You live to proclaim Christ. It's what we see in the very next verse, in verse 21. Look there with me. At the end of verse 20, remember Paul says that his upcoming trial is going to turn out for his deliverance, meaning he's either going to be delivered from, from trial and prison and live, or he's going to be delivered and, and die. Now, in verse 21, Paul's going to reflect then on those two possibilities, those two possible outcomes. And he's going to reflect on what each of them will mean for, for him. And so first he's going to reflect on this possibility, this outcome of, of being set free and continuing to live. And, and we see this in verse 21. Look there with me. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Meaning, if Paul goes to court and he's, and he's released and he's allowed to live, then him being allowed to live and being freed from court is going to mean Christ, which means in the context it's going to mean more ministry for Christ. It's going to, it means it's, he's going to continue to proclaim Christ. It, that's, that's what that means, to live as Christ, the proclamation of Christ, more ministry for Christ. And the reason we know that is because what, what he says in the very next verse, in verse 22, look there with me. In verse 22, he unpacks and explains what he means to live as Christ. Here's what it means. Look at verse 20. Paul says, if I am to live, so there's the live language again, in the flesh, I mean, if I'm released from prison and allowed to continue to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And so that, that's what it means to live as Christ. That's what to live as Christ means here. To live as Christ means fruitful labor as he continues to proclaim Christ and enjoy the fruit that comes from laboring for Christ and evangelism and proclaiming Christ. And so that's what, that's what being released from prison and, and being allowed to live means for Paul. To live for Paul means Christ. It means proclaiming Christ, laboring for Christ, enjoying the fruitful labor that comes from proclaiming Christ. So, let's personalize this real quick and ask ourselves this question. If Paul's allowed to live and not be executed, then living for him means proclaiming Christ, laboring for Christ. Which then begs the question, if you're allowed to live, and God in his sovereignty allows your heart to continue to beat the rest of this, af this afternoon or the rest of this week, then what will living mean for you? Like just fill in the blank. What, what will living mean for you? Will living mean more TV? Will living mean more Facebook and Instagram? Will living mean just more hours at work? Like, what, what will living mean for you if God in his providence and sovereignty allows you to live and frees you and allows you to live? 
Will it mean Christ? Will it mean proclaiming Christ? Will it mean laboring for Christ? Will it mean fruitful labor for you? For the person who's consumed with Christ, who treasures Jesus above all, then this is why they're alive. This is what living means for them. They're alive. Living means to proclaim Christ. So if God allows them to live, then they're going to proclaim Christ and labor for Christ because that's what it means to live because he's their greatest treasure and preeminent in their hearts and in their lives. Third characteristic of a life that treasures Jesus above all is that your greatest desire above anything and everything else is to be with Christ. Your greatest desire is to be with Christ. We see this in the second half of verse 21 there. I skipped it. But look there again with me, the second half of verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So again, remember the context here. If Paul's released from prison, allowed to live, then that will mean Christ, proclaiming Christ, laboring for Christ. But if he's sentenced to death and executed and dies, then for Paul, he says death is gain. It's gain. And again, let's, let's be honest, that, that's weird. That goes completely against the culture and everything we hear in the culture in which we live. Everything in our culture treats death like the plague and seeks to avoid death at, at, at all cost. And so how in the world is death gain? Well, well, he tells us a couple verses later in verse 23. Look at verse 23. The second sentence in verse 23, he says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. And so then this right here is, is why death is gained to Christ. It's gain because it means if he dies, it means he gets to be with Christ. And this is his desire, right? This is what he says his desires. He longs to be with Christ. That word desire there in verse 23 in the, in the ESV, it, yeah, it means desire, but it means a whole lot more than that. It means intense, passionate longing. And so then this is what Paul's saying here. He, he passionately longs to be with Christ. He passionately longs to depart from this life. He passionately longs, intense, passionate longing to depart, to leave this world, to leave this life, and to be with Christ. Which then begs the question, why? Why, 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 why does he want to depart and so passionately long to depart and be with Christ so much? Well, he tells us at the very end of verse 23. He says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, and here's why. For that is far better. Don't you love that? Like far better than what? Far better than life. Far better than living here on this earth. Far better. It's far better. Like it's not just better. You catch that? Like it's far better. Those words there in the SV, far better, could literally be translated as more by much better. More by much better. That's, that's how much better. That being with Christ is than living another second here on this earth. It's superior to and far better than anything in this life. Nothing in this life even gets remotely close to being with Christ. It's far superior. It's better than having a child. It's better than hugging your kid. It's better than walking down the aisle. It's better than your dream job. It's better than your, your dream career. It's better than anything on your bucket list it's better than living for 10, 20, 50, 70 more years on this life. It's better than your next breath. Being with Jesus is better than all of that. Nothing else even comes remotely close to it. Being with Christ is more by much better than it all. And that's why death is gain. That's why death is gain. Death is gain isn't, isn't 
simply because there won't be any more sin, there won't be any more suffering, there won't be any more pain, there won't be any more heartache. Yes, all of those things are true, but the main reason that death is gain is because you get to see Jesus face to face and you get to be with Christ. And so then do you see the practical difference that that reality should make in our lives? Like when death is gained to you, it causes you, it enables you to face death in its face to face and not even flinch. It allows you to face the possibility of death like with joy. That, that's why you put all this together, why at the very end of verse 18, when Paul's going to trial and he might be executed, he says, yes, and I will rejoice. Like, how do he do that? He can do that, he can rejoice, because he knows that if he dies, it's gain. What are they going to do to me? Kill me? Gain. My greatest desire, one thing I passionately long for more than anything, will be fulfilled if they kill me. So kill me. And if not, I'll just go on proclaiming Christ. Like, so win win. I remember, can't remember the exact time, but six, seven years ago, uh, being in a hospital room um, with former member uh, Bob Reasons. And he just had a massive heart attack. They were about to haul him back uh, for surgery. And I mean, he was, he was, he was about to die. Uh, he was staring death face to face. And I remember him and his family, and I was in there, and uh, just the peaceful look on his face. Uh, and looking up and saying, you know, if I don't make it, I'll see you on the other side. And um, just the most peaceful face I've probably ever seen in my life. Like as a church, we have sent missionaries and hope to send more to dangerous places in the world. And the reality is some of them might die one day. And so why do we send missionaries? And why do missionaries go to places and to people that can potentially kill them? Because they think the same thing that Bob thought. Death is gain. You get to be you get to be with Christ. And being with Christ is far better, much more by much better than living another two seconds here in this world. You see, when your greatest treasure in life is to be with Christ, then you're able to rejoice even in the face of death. This then leads to the fourth and final characteristic of a life who treasures Jesus above all. It's this. It's that you make decisions with the selfless, humble mindset of Christ. You make decisions with the selfless, humble mindset of Christ. We see the example of, of Paul here in, in verse 22. Look there with me. If you remember up to this point, he said that his upcoming trial is gonna lead to one or, or two possible outcomes. It's either gonna, live to meet, it's gonna lead to, to life or it's gonna lead to death. Now in verse 22, and this is kind of funny, in verse 22, Paul's gonna tell us which of these he would choose if he had the choice. He doesn't have the choice. Everybody with me? Like this choice isn't, isn't ultimately up to Paul about whether or not he's going to be freed at trial or executed. So whether he's going to live or die isn't ultimately up to him, but he's going to share with us if it was up to him. Here's what he would choose. And we see it there in verse 22. He says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. In other words, this is a really difficult decision for Paul. He, he doesn't know which of these he would choose if he had, if he had a chance, to live or to, or to die. And just place yourself in his shoes. This is a grueling, agonizing, he's hard-pressed. He doesn't know which of these to choose, living or dying, if he really had the choice. And here's why, though, it's so difficult and such an agonizing decision for him. It's because in the rest of verse 23, he says that my desire, again, my passion and longing is to depart and be with Christ, 
for that is more of my much better. So that's his passion and longing. And it's superior, it's better than the other option. And so we hear that, right? And we're like, well, duh, Paul, that's your, that's your answer. If it's your passionate longing, and if it's far superior than option, option B, then what in the world are you waiting on? Do it. Choose it. But here's why it's such a difficult decision for Paul. Verse 24. But to remain in the flesh and keep living is more necessary on your account. Do you see the dilemma Paul's in here? And what makes this decision so difficult for him? On one hand, you have what he passionately longs for and desires above anything and everything else in this life. But on the other hand, you have what's necessary for the Philippians. And so what is he gonna choose? What he desires and passionately longs for? Or what's best and necessary for the Philippians? Well, look what he chooses in verse 25. He says, convinced of this, meaning convinced that it's more necessary for you if I stay alive, since I'm convinced of that. It's better for you if I stay alive. Since I'm convinced of that, then I know that I will remain alive and continue with you all. So then do you see the choice Paul makes here? On one hand, he, he doesn't choose what he wants. He doesn't choose what he desires and what's far better for him. Instead, he chooses what's best and necessary for the Philippians and what would most benefit them. And we're gonna see the same attitude in chapter two in Jesus. Like this is a selfless mindset of Christ. It's putting the interest of others ahead of your own. It's choosing what's best for others rather than choosing what's best for you and what you desire. And so then again, like, let's personalize this. Is this how you make decisions in your life? When you're faced with a difficult decision and you're not for sure what to do, should I take this job or that job? Should I move here or there? Should I say yes to this opportunity or, or that opportunity? Or whatever. That as you are faced with these hard decisions, do you, do you make them simply based upon what you want, what you desire, what would be more by much better for you? Or do you take others into consideration and ask what's necessary for them? What's better for them? What's best for them? What's most beneficial for them? And that even includes our church. That even includes our, our church. Because here you have Paul asking, What's best for the church at Philippi? What's best for the Philippian church? I, I know what I want, but what's best for the members of the church there? And so then as you wrestle through like the hard, difficult decisions in your life, like think about this church. Like as you, as you make decisions, ask, what's best for this church? What will best, most benefit the members of Cross Fellowship Church? What impact will this job possibility have on them? What impact will moving into this house have on them? What impact will saying yes to this opportunity have on them? What's necessary for them? What's more by much better for them? That's the first question Paul asks. He considers, and that we need to consider as we wrestle through difficult decisions in our lives. The second question he asks, though, and that we need to ask then, is what is best for the advancement of the gospel? So first, what is best for the church? But second, what is best for the advancement of the gospel? And that's what Paul goes on to mention in the rest of verse 25. Look there with me. He says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. Now catch this. For your progress and joy in the faith. When Paul here talks about the Philippians' progress and joy in the faith, at first glance, it can seem like he's referring to their sanctification and their ongoing growth in their faith and their ongoing growth in their, in their walk with Christ. But, but that's not what Paul's referring to here. Instead, do you see the word progress there in, in verse 25? That word progress 
is the same exact Greek word that's translated as advance in verse 12, where Paul was talking about how his imprisonment has served to advance the gospel. Well, he's using that word in the exact same way here in verse 25. He's saying that if he stays alive, then it will allow him to continue with the Philippians in their advancement in the faith. And that word in, in the faith, could also be translated as of, of the faith. He's saying that him staying alive would allow him to continue with the Philippians in their advancement of the faith. So then, what, what's the faith that the Philippians are going to continue to advance here? Well, the faith that he's referring to here is a reference to the gospel. That oftentimes, we're going to see this throughout the rest of the book of Philippians, but oftentimes in Paul's letters, Paul uses the word faith as a synonym or as a reference to the gospel. Like in Galatians 1, verse 23, it says that Paul went about preaching the faith, meaning he went about preaching the gospel. As a church, we use the word faith in the same way, right? That as a church, we have a statement of faith. And that statement of faith explains, it outlines, it articulates the body of doctrine, the gospel truths that we believe. And so then that's how Paul's using the word faith here. He's using it as a reference to the gospel. He's saying that if he remains alive, it, that's better for the Philippians because it will allow him to continue with them in their advancement of the gospel. In this way then, verse 12 when he talks about his imprisonment, serves to advance the gospel. In verse 25, he talks about um, him being freed from prison and being allowed to live will lead to their advancement of the gospel. It serves as a bookend for this section here in Philippians. But as they advance the gospel, do you see the result of what will happen? It will lead to and result in the Philippians' joy. Just like the advancement of the gospel led to Paul's joy, in verse 12. That's why in verse 25, Paul speaks of the Philippians' advancement and joy of the faith, because that's what advancing the gospel results in and leads to. Advancing the gospel leads to, leads to joy. And so then this is what drove Paul's decision, that even though he desired to be with Christ, he chose what is best for the advancement of the gospel. So then ask yourself this question. As you're faced with the decisions in your life, as you're making decisions in your life, do you, do you ask yourself, what is best in this decision for the advancement of the gospel? What will best serve to advance the gospel? What will help others to advance the gospel? How will this decision hinder or serve my involvement in the advancement of the gospel, my partnership with others in the advancement of the gospel? The final question we need to ask then when we're wrestling with the decisions, what is best for the church? What is best for the advancement of the gospel? And then finally would be to ask, what is best then for the glory of Christ? What is best for the glory of Christ? We see this being a huge part, the most important part of the decision that Paul makes here. Like this is the ultimate reason that Paul chooses to remain with the Philippians and to remain alive even though he desires to be with Christ. He wants to remain alive with the Philippians because it's best for the glory of Christ. It's what he says in verse 26. Look at verse 26 with me. He says, it's, he says he's going to remain alive, and then he says in verse 26, so that, here's why, in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. In other words, when Paul's released from prison in Rome and he goes to Philippi, and the Philippians see him with their eyes, and they see him in the flesh. This one that they've partnered with for 12 years who was about to die in prison, and they see him with their very own eyes. You know what the, the result in the, of that's gonna be? They're gonna rejoice, they're gonna, they're gonna glory in Christ. They're gonna magnify Christ. It's gonna be cause for them to glory in the person of, of Jesus. And nothing is, is more important to him than that. And so if him remaining alive and going back to Philippi leads them to glory in Christ, then forget dying, even though death's gain and that's his greatest desire, let me get back to Philippi to be with Christ, or to be with Philippians, because it will lead to the glory of Christ, and that's all he cares about is the glory of Christ. What he wants is best for him. 
It's not even on the table. It's not even under consideration. She begs the question again, is this us? Is this how we make decisions? Are we willing to forfeit our desires, whatever they might be, if forfeiting those desires would mean God would receive greater glory some other way? So Lord, I I desire to get married. I desire to, to be healthy. I desire a friend. I desire kids. I desire this pain to go away. But those are my desires. But if, you're, if you get greater glory from my desires not being fulfilled, then don't fulfill my desires and glorify your name. Because what's most impo- important to me isn't my desires. What's most important to you is that you get glory. So if you get glory apart from my desires, then get glory. That, this right here is what it looks like to treasure Jesus above all. It means that, that, that just like Paul, you're, you're more concerned with the glory of Christ than, than life or death. It means that you live to proclaim Christ. It means that, that your greatest desire in all of life is to be with Christ. It, it means that you make decisions with the selfless, humble mindset of, of Christ. Which then begs this question, how, how, like, how how do I live like this? How do I get to the point in my life where I treasure Christ like this? Like, we're going through all this, and I want that. I want to say that's true of me. I want that to be true of my life. I want that to be my biggest concern and passion and desire. I want to be consumed with these things. I want others to look at my life and say, that's true of me. But it's not. So how do we get there? How do we get to the point of treasuring Christ, desiring Christ like this? Well, here's how. You see him for who he truly is. You see him for who he truly is. Because when you see Jesus for who he truly is, and you behold his beauty and his glory and his worth and his majesty, then you can't help but treasure him and be consumed with him. Like Paul is here you got to see him for who he truly is. Which then begs the question, well, who is he? Who is he? Well, here's who he is. And we'll close with this. He's the true and better Adam who withstood the temptation of Satan and imputed his righteousness to us. He's the seed of the woman who came and bruised Satan's head. He's the promised seed of Abraham who blesses the nations. He's the greater Moses who brought about a new exodus and delivered us out of bondage to sin and death. He's our Passover lamb who saved us from death. He's our great high priest, slaughtered lamb, and final ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He's the promised son of man who's been given dominion and glory and a kingdom. He's the son of David, the promised Messiah, who's the king who reigns over all. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. He's the final prophet. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the author and perfecter of our faith, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the great I am, the light of the world, the faithful witness, our redeemer, the risen Lord, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, the true vine, the chief cornerstone, the firstborn from the dead, the heir of all things, the judge of the living and the dead, the mediator of the new and better covenant, our righteousness, the wisdom of God, the son of God, and on and on and on. Like that's who he is. And and it's only when we see Jesus for who he truly is then we can't help when we see who he truly is. We can't help then be more concerned for his glory than our life or death. And we can't help but live now to proclaim his glory. 
And we can't help now but long and desire to depart from this life and be with him. And we can't help but now make decisions now with the selfless, humble mindset of Christ. And the reason we can't help but do these things now is because we treasure him above anything and everything else this world has to offer. And because of that $3 worth of Jesus for us isn't enough. We want all of him. Let's pray together.